Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our Endgame class. Hooray! Right? Hooray. And this is going to be my most specific lecture, right? Or as Kramer would say, Pacific. Oh wait, he would say specific when he meant Pacific. Darn, I messed that joke up. Take two. Okay, I've been watching Seinfeld. Your favorite show, because you've heard of it. She hasn't heard of it. Okay, so uh, in this position, I brilliantly, can you see it? Played Pawn Takes Queen. Normally, I would say D takes C5, but because of you, we'll do Pawn Takes Queen. There you go. Okay, now, uh, as you may have figured out by now, but probably not, this lecture is going to be about a very specific endgame, Rook and Bishop versus Rook and Knight. Notice one side has a rook and a bishop, there has a rook and a knight. And usually there's pawns on the board. When there's no pawns on the board, then it's a draw. When there's pawns on the board, which side usually has the advantage? Let's vote. Who says rook and bishop? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on what kind of bishop. I, I said usually. Yeah. And, which so and, and wh who says rook and knight? And who, 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 who abstains? You abstain? The abstentions have it. Yeah, rook and bishop is usually better than rook and knight, which is definitely the case here. And we especially like it better when there's pawns on both sides of the board, which we have here. Now, this was a game that I messed up, and I've lectured on this game before, but you guys didn't see it. If you did see it, you forgot, right? Okay, and this was played in the Georgia Open last month against Samartha Belayaru. Cool name. Okay, now... In this position, uh, white has a very strong passed pawn. And I've discussed this in previous lectures. Not all things are equal, even when they're equal, right? Okay, so for example, in chess, you learned a long time ago that certain pieces have a certain value and they're better or worse than other pieces. An example for the class would be a queen is better than a knight, right? Okay. However, you were also taught that trading pieces is usually an equal kind of proposition. So if I take your knight and you take my knight, that should be fair. However, it's usually the case that pieces that are the same, sometimes one is better than another. And that happens here because I have a passed pawn and my opponent has a passed pawn. And you would think, well, a pawn is worth a pawn. And a passed pawn is worth a passed pawn. But that's not true based on your great judgment of years of experience. Which pawn is better? The red one or the green one? Red one's better. What's that? Red one. Yeah, the red one is closer to queening. Much closer than, the, than the, this one over here. That's going to take forever to queen. Okay, now luckily for my opponent, he's blocking my pawn. But he has a lot of issues. His knight's blocking my pawn, his knight's defending d5, and his knight is attacked by my rook, and his rook is defending his knight. And I've said this in many lectures, and actually, I'm one of the few people who doesn't like to denote what kind of position it is based on, you know, these rules that we're given and we're told to live by, right? I'm going to take a knee right now to show that I don't like what we're talking about here, okay? You agree? No. Okay. And what I mean is, people are like, this is the opening, this is the middle game, this is the end game. Okay, but in chess, you should make good moves and have good understanding that usually applies to all positions. And so, in this position, one thing that I like, which I like in any position, is that this guy is attacking this guy, and this guy is defending this guy. And when you have a situation like that, it's favorable for the attacking guy. You'd rather be attacking than defending, even if you can't win right away. So I like that for white. My rook is better than his rook. Okay, he played a5 for obvious reasons, because you push your a pawn. Okay, now, if I'm going to take one of these pawns, I like to take all of his pawns, which is the easiest to take? Yeah? The D5 pawn. The D5 pawn, because I'm already attacking it. Also, if I could cheat, and since I'm a grandmaster, I can, I would want to put my rook somewhere else. Somewhere that's pinning his knight. Where would that be? Rook D7. Rook D7. So I actually played rook D7 here. 
And my opponent didn't say anything because I'm a grandmaster. She just got scared. Right, Karen? She's like, no. So Rook D7 would be really strong. Now, there's a grandmaster you never heard of. I'm going to say two of you have heard of him. Yuri Shulman. Who's heard of Yuri Shulman? Yes. I had two people raise their hands. Okay. Now, Yuri Shulman was the U.S. chess champion, and now he's not. And his USCF rating used to be 2,700. Now it's not. And he did something I've never heard of. In a U.S. championship, his USCF rating went up 50 points, 5-0. I can't gain 50 points. If I beat Magnus Carlsen 100 games in a row, I wouldn't gain 50 points. I'd gain more. And he didn't even win that tournament. So he gained 50 points and didn't win the tournament. I've never heard of a grandmaster gaining 50 points. Anyway, Yuri Shulman, the reason I mentioned his name, he was teaching chess once and he said, if you want to make a move and you can't make it, but you really want to make it, you make it anyway. Right? I want to play rook d7. I can't play rook d7. I'm going to play rook d7 anyway. And Archer claims this pawn's the weakest. So now everybody in the room knows what move I played. See, they're all yelling it out. What move did White play? You. Rook D8. I played Rook D8. I'm attacking the pawn, and I want to play Rook D7. I got everything going for me. Okay. He played King F6, following my rule, move your king up in the end game. And some of you would take this pawn, but I don't like that. Okay, because... This knight's very passive. This rook's very passive. This bishop's really strong. I don't want to win a measly pawn and get to some drawn endgame. And what's going to happen is if I trade everything and then he pushes his pawn and I push my pawn and we trade pawns, in the end, I'll have these four pawns and he'll have these three pawns on the same side of the board. And when things are on the same side of the board, that tends to be a draw. When they're on opposite sides of the board, you can win because your opponent's looking both ways. So bishop takes d5 isn't a good move. I played the obvious move. The one I told you I wanted to play. Rook d7. Actually, I'm not sure if I played that. I think so. Yeah, rook d7. This game was played like a month ago. I can't remember. Okay, now if it was my turn to move, what would I play? What would white do here if it was his turn? Yeah. Probably bishop takes d5 because the knight's pinned. If you don't like bishop takes d5, rook takes h7 is probably okay. But I think I'll, okay. Now my opponent made a mistake, a very bad mistake. Probably he's losing, but he played king e6. Terrible move. Okay. Now, the move actually makes a lot of sense because it stops bishop takes d5. Because actually it does, I could still play bishop takes d5. Then he would take my rook. I would take his rook. He'd queen his a-pawn. Man, he might queen his a-pawn then. i to watch it. Okay. But the reason it's bad is it's a very temporary measure. He stopped bishop takes d5, but only for one move. So when I play c6, which threatens to take his rook and queen and defends my rook, now where can he move his rook and stay on his knight? Rook a7. Rook a7. And now I play bishop takes d5. So king e6 was terrible. That was a really bad move. And so that's the kind of move you play when you're not thinking ahead. King e6. And then when I played c6, he was like, oh, this isn't good. Yeah, so king e6 loses the game. Probably he's losing anyway, but this accelerates the defeat. Now he has to play rook a7, I take. If he plays knight takes, I play rook takes rook with a very easy win. And now he's in trouble of getting mated. If you don't believe me, and you don't, if he plays here, I made him in two moves. Archer agrees. I check him, and then I made him. So, man, king e6 was a bad move. So he played instead of king e5. Yeah. The other legal move. That's right. Very good. Okay. And I played f4, of course, because I want to play mate. That's true. I wouldn't lie to you. So it's funny that in an end game where we're trying to queen a pawn, it turns out his king is getting mated. And usually you don't think about that. And then when it happens, you're like, oh, yeah, my king's getting mated. But king e6 was a really terrible blunder. 
Okay, he played knight b5. Makes sense, right? Okay, now, all of you were taught the wrong thing. That's why you're in my class, so I can retrain your brain, okay? Okay, it's lobotomy time. You were taught when you're ahead material, you should trade pieces. Boo! Incorrect. You should trade bad pieces for good pieces. In your professional opinion, which rook is better? My rook is much better. My rook's the greatest. His rook is stopping mate. I can't play mate because he takes my rook. Okay. And I want to play rook takes rook, but he takes back with the knight. So you know what I should do? I should remove the defender. So here I had a really tough time because I have two really obvious moves. There's two ways to attack the knight. What are they? Bishop C4. And? Yeah. Right, and I was like, wow, rook b7 wins and bishop c4 wins. I was so confused. I couldn't see a defense to either one. Okay, I played bishop c4. I'm not sure why. Rook b7 is also good. And if he moves his knight, I'll take the rook for free. If he moves his knight where I can't take the rook for free, I'll checkmate him. Probably you were thinking of the movie Sophie's Choice. Yeah, she, she nodded, so she gets it. That's good. Yeah. She got the joke. Okay. Right? No, nothing? Okay. So, if two grandmasters were playing here, what would Black do? Resign. Resign. Okay, if I turn the engine on, my computer will blow up. It'll say plus a trillion. But he didn't resign because some people don't resign, which is fine. So he took my rook, so I wouldn't mate him. And now I'm threatening the queen. So he prevented that. Yeah, and then I took his knight. And he never resigned, so I, I played bishop a4 because I'm mean. And then I moved my king up. Okay, now everybody in the world would queen here and queening is the best move, but I want to trap his kings, so I went here. However, if I had queened, and he went here, I have made in one, and there's two ways to do it. Can anybody find them? Queen d4. Queen d4 and? Oh wait, I thought queen d6 was made, but it's not. Oh. So queen d4, is there another answer? Yeah. There is? I should Yeah, I thought this was made, but it's not. King c4, that's made though. Okay, so I play king d6, king c7. Now his king can't escape, so I made him. Yay, bishop b5 mate was the funniest. I have many other mates too, right? Like mate and mate and mate. But I like bishop b5, getting all my pieces involved. Okay, so in that instance, my rook was better than his, but also my bishop was better than his knight. His knight was very passive. Now, that game wasn't very good because I was playing it. But we have other games where people are actually good. And we'll get to those people. Okay, one you've heard of, Robert James Fisher. Okay, and in this position, black played rook takes c8. So now we have rook and bishop against rook and knight. White has three advantages. The first one is the rook and bishop is usually better than the rook and knight. The second is black has doubled pawns here and doubled pawns here. So that's not good because double pawns are usually weaker, usually. But more importantly, white, uh, black can't create a pass pawn on the king's side with his pawns like this. Probably if this was here, I would expect a draw. Here, I think white probably win. Okay, you must activate your pieces. Of all of these pawns, which one is the most likely that white can capture for free? Ooh. Yeah? B7. I hear three for B7. Yeah? B6. Yeah, I don't know which is more accurate, B6 or B7. B6 is hard to defend, and B7 is hard to defend, but it is defended. Yeah. So it's going to be B6 and B7. You're not going to take these other points. So white played rook D1, because you got to activate your rook. And white has a very interesting way to try to attack B6. He has the obvious way. Then he has another way, which is this. And he's all over these pawns. Okay. Yes? Why wouldn't he just play b4 and dislodge them? Okay. If you play b4, you're weakening your own structure. 
and you're breaking my rule, never move pawns. Okay, in this position, these pawns are solid and black is on the open file against a pawn that's defended. If you play b4, your c3 pawn's really weak. Okay, and if the guy takes c3, you'll be PO'd and you have to see the Star Wars movie. No, nothing? No, you got it? Okay, good. And you've heard it before, I still didn't get it. Okay, so what? I got it. Okay, and also, he wanted to play r2, d2. Okay, anyway, so after b4, your c3 pawn's pretty weak, knight a4, etc. mainly etc. Okay, so rook d1, king f8, rook d4. Now, what would black have played if I played rook to d6? Hmm, maybe he would have played knight a4. Yeah, that makes sense. I agree with that. I think he won't play knight a4 here. So that's actually attacking and defending. He's going to go here, and there's no knight a4 counterplay. Attacking all the pawns. And defending this pawn. So he stops knight a4, his rook can go to b4, and what's black, what's black going to do about it? Rook c7. Okay, so he's defending this pawn, so his knight can defend the other pawn. Pretty good defense h3 okay and what would what would i say about that move what's h3 do anybody i'll see it as an insurance against possibly getting mated yeah it's called luft make luft not war right yeah now he won't get made on the back rank correct okay f5 advancing his pawn majority rook b4 i assume knight d7 i assumed right Okay, now my bishop is perfect and my rook is perfect. What's the one white piece not perfect? King. King. King's just sitting here doing nothing. Now, in this position, as I said in the previous example, sometimes your pieces are attacking and sometimes they're defending and nobody can take anything. However, it's advantageous to be attacking. This bishop is attacking the pawn. This rook is attacking the pawn and the black pieces are defending. So one side's attacking, one side's defending. So good for the attacking side. King f1, obviously. They move their kings up, as was the style. Now king d8, which confuses you, because it doesn't move the king up. He wants to play king c8 defending his pawn, then his rook can start moving. Because his rook's sitting on c7, that's not very good. Okay, rook b5, attacking a pawn. g6, obviously. King e3. Now my king can go in either direction. Start coming in on the position. King c8. Now his rook can move. King d4. King b8. King d5. Wow, here comes the king. And you can see my king is good and your king is not. So white should be winning now. Rook c6. Stopping the king from coming in. King d4, attacking the rook by discovery. Rook e6. a4, advancing his majority. King c7, defending all the pawns. a5, advancing the majority again. Check. He blocks the check. And now, the problem is, normally, uh, if you're black, and you can trade all the pieces off, you could get to a drawn endgame, because it's a king of pawning with even pawns. But not here. This is a very easily winning king and pawn ending for two reasons. One is white's king is way up on the board and black's isn't. And equally important, as I said earlier, you can't create a pass pawn here. If this pawn was here, as I said earlier, that would be fine. So white's going to have a pawn majority on the queen's side. Black can't make the pawn majority. So bishop d5 puts a lot of pressure on these pawns. And you can't really... You can't really trade everything because you'll lose the king upon endgame. King c8 takes f6, stopping everything. He unpins himself. And here comes the bishop. And once again, white is attacking and black is defending. White's attacking the knight. Black's defending it. White's attacking the pawn. Black's not defending it. So he plays king c7, letting him take the pawn. And the problem is... If he takes the pawn, this knight gets really active. And the bishop could get trapped over here. Although I'd probably take the pawn. Can't scare me. 
Taking the pawn's risky because after knight c4 check, the black rook is coming in. Man. So this bishop is doing a really good job controlling the knight. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so that's actually a pretty good bishop. Okay, rook c5 check. And he takes the pawn. First he stops knight c4 check. Then he takes the pawn. Pretty smart, right? Yeah. Knight d5 check. Knight e7, trapping the bishop. Now, how would you get that bishop out of there? It's funny. You guys all know the famous Fischer Spassky. I'm sure you're all thinking that. From what year? When Fischer played Spassky for the World Championship? Tough class. You can guess. 72, right. Very good. And in 1972, Fischer famously played Bishop Takes H2, trapping his bishop, and he lost. Now his bishop's trapped. It's 1962. He prepared for that game. However, unlike the other game, his bishop can get out. So what move can he make to get his bishop out? How does he get his bishop out of there? G4, G4 is close. Yeah, G4 might do it. But that G6 pawn is the one you want to get rid of. H4. Yeah, don't you guys see my match with Ginger GM? H4. Okay, and H5, and the bishop gets out. Now this is funny, after the move b6, king b7, h5, king a6, c4, takes, takes. Now, not only is white a pawn ahead, but black has three isolated pawns. Now if we go back in this position after, yeah, h4, that's funny. I thought there was a knight d5 variation, but that wasn't played. I'm very confused. Maybe it's another game. Okay. So I'm getting confused. Okay, takes. Rook d4. b3. Solid. Defending his pawn. King e3. Bishop e4. And this is just an easy win. White's up a pawn, and black has a terrible pawn structure. So this is no problem at all. Takes b5 so in this position it would be really hard for me not to play rook takes g2 very hard aha i finally see what white would do anybody else see it or just me anybody what would you do after rook takes g2 i finally figured it out I thought rook takes g2 won a pawn, but it doesn't. Truth hurts. Which pawn do you want to win, this one or this one? Which is easier? F6. F6. So attack it. Bam. Rook f4. Rook f4. I defended my pawn. I attacked your pawn, and you can't do anything about it. Truth hurts. Okay, so he played b5. Somebody explained the reasoning behind b5. I've said it in many endgame lectures. Anybody? Me? Nobody's calling on me. When you're playing an end game and you're losing and or worse, which I think is pretty obvious black is worse, down two pawns, right? Do you want to trade pawns? Who wants to trade pawns here, white or black? White. Close. I'll give you one more guess. Good answer. Right. Because if there's no pawns on the board, you won't win. Although you would win because Rook and Bishop beats Rook when you're low rated. When you're a super grandmaster, a rook draws against a rook and a bishop. Or if you're a computer, at the lower level, is very suspicious. However, when there's pawns on the board, then they become queens. When there's no pawns on the board, they don't become queens because there's no pawns. For example, if you had two knights and two pawns, and I had two knights, I could sacrifice my knights for your pawns. You'd be up two knights, but you wouldn't win. Two knights don't beat a king. So when you're trying to win and you have an advantage, you want to keep as many pawns as possible. When you're worse or losing, you want to trade all the pawns off. There's no pawns on the board. So black played b5, so there's no pawns on the board. Rook f4, as we said earlier. Takes, 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 takes. And then king c3, two pawns. That's barely enough to win. 
And unfortunately, two pawns. Man, that knight's not looking so good. Can't go anywhere. Okay, and as was the style at the time, black resigned. And the computer says, probably shouldn't resign. Only plus three for white. Plus four, well, okay, plus four. Tough. Yeah. So in that, in that game, as we see in most rook and bishop versus knight, the knight didn't do very well. It was passive. The bishop was controlling more squares. And I was taught the reason bishops are better than knights when they are better is because they're faster. So if your knight's here and you want to take this pawn, that takes forever. If your bishop's here, you can go to any part of the board immediately. Okay, very quick. One or two moves, you can get anywhere. And you can control a whole line. The knight only controls in its own area. So in these endings with pawns on both sides of the board, normally the bishop's better. And in fact, Fisher was a big exponent of this idea. What's funny is, the picture of Fisher is, he was really young. That picture right here, that's a very young Fisher. In 62, he wasn't very old. Who knows how old he was in 62? Anybody? There we go. Here's somebody knows. He has to do math, though. That's the problem. 18? I guess 17. He was 18 or 19, depending on the date. And this says 4-2, which, as you know, means 2-4, because it's always written in, you know, it's German. So if it was February 4th, you are correct. If it was March, if it was April 2nd, because you know, his birthday obviously is. Fisher's birthday? What? Come on. Anybody? Knows it's 64. Uh, what? Not, I mean, it's 44. Right? Keep, keep trying. 43? Yeah. March 9th. He died when he was 64, right? And he died in 2008. So yeah, I guess it would. Unclear. Depends on whether his birthday or not. What I do know is it's March 9th, 1943, so he was 18 during this game. That's correct. Very good. Okay, and then he won, but he's probably, picture sure he was like 12. Okay, so hooray, Fisher. Okay, now, this was played in 63 between Petrosian and Botvinnik, and this is a world championship match. Who won that match? Petrosian. Good answer. Okay. And this was Botvinnik's last world championship match. And he's like, I'm old, leave me alone. Okay. And after Rook takes, it's obvious this is Rook and Knight versus Rook and Bishop because that's our lecture. So Now we're going to vote. Voting is tough. I'm guessing three to two because there's five people in here. Although probably a better guess is two to two with one abstention. You can vote whether you'd rather have white or black. That's how you can vote. If it's white's move, I'd rather have white. So it's black's move. Who says they'd rather have white? The hands slowly yeah, go up. And who'd rather have black? Are you abstaining? Okay, we'll give you more time. Black? So it's three to two, right? Yes. When it was the same family wanted to have black, and people not in the family wanted to have white. Right? All right. If I turn on the engine, it's going to say white's much better. Okay? And the difference between this ending and the other ones is that's a good knight. Now, that's a knight, and you can't attack the knight. Nothing you can do. That knight's there forever. You can't play f5. You can't play d5. You can't play king f5. You can't play king d5. And if you could play king f5 or king d5, which you can't, I can defend my knight. And then you, what are you going to do? Now, <clears throat> there's two kinds of passed pawns. One's the queen and one's you capture. That's the one you capture. White has 5 million pieces blocking it. <clears throat> White has an obvious threat. Rook takes bishop. If you move your bishop to a random square somewhere that's innocuous, I can play knight d2 and I take it. So that pawn's not going to live very long, and this pawn's no good. That's a weak, isolated pawn. That pawn was on f6. Okay, then we could kick the knight out later. If it was on d6, we could kick the knight out. But e6, no good. When your opponent has an isolated pawn and you have a knight in front of it, that's good because no pawn can attack it. 
So this is better for white, as Petrosian indicated. Okay, so bishop b4, which I guess is forced, because I'm going to take your bishop, I'm going to win your pawn. So he stopped all that. And white played the obvious move. Rook c2. Rook c2. You could have been world champion in 63. A little young. But. Okay. King e7. I like king e7. That way there's none of this knight d6 check stuff. Stops a lot of that. Knight d2. He's going to take the pawn. Now, if you take my knight and I take back, you're not going to save your pawn. I'm going to go take your pawn. Yeah. So he played c3. Knight went back. Black played c4. And they agreed to a draw. Repetition. Confusing the audience. Yeah. Okay. Bishop a5. Ugh. King d3 with obvious threats. Check. King c4. And our king can hide on b3. You can't check it. And then I can finally take this pawn. So he got counterplay. Counterplay is good. And in this position, man, I don't like that bishop, but I like that knight. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. And now, this is very interesting. When I was looking at this game earlier, <clears throat> I was thinking g3, 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 because my pawn's attacked. Right? And then I turn down the engine, and I have it set to the top three moves. No g3. Okay, and actually, it makes sense not to play g3, because when you play g3, black has two to one over here, and he can actually get a passed age pawn. If you give him enough time, he can, he can start pushing his pawns. Okay, and for some reason, the guy who was the best player in the world played the best move. Interesting, huh? Well, if you don't play g3, you don't save your g-pawn, this move's pretty obvious, I think. But, well, if you don't save the g-pawn, he's got two, he can push the pawn. That, that's just... what you think. Yeah, he stopped all that, too. He did everything. What a genius. You can't push your h-pawn if I take it. I'm serious. He indirectly attacked the h7-pawn by playing the move rook c7 check. Now, he was the world champion. He just jumped over his king. So what move did he play? Yeah. He moved his king backwards? You don't move backwards with your king. Rawr. King, king where? D4. Yeah. Somehow the world champion played the best move. Now, in the other endings we were looking at, the bishop was better than the knight. Now my knight is the best and your bishop's the worst. And if you take my g pawn, I can check and take your h pawn. And then you have four horrible pawns, and your bishop's horrible, right? Okay, so king d4, the computer move. Also, maybe white's going to play king e5 and just start checkmating you, because he's got a king and knight and rook against your king. Okay, king d7, stopping rook c7 check. It's like that guy was the reigning world champion. Can you believe that? So was Bavnik the world champion during this match, and then Petrosian beat him? Yeah. Here's something you didn't know unless you knew it. But if you didn't know it, then I'm right. Right? When, when Bavina became the world champion, and you guys all know why, I think you're my only hope. I think he became... What, what was the question? When did, how did Bavnik become the world champion the first time? You're my only hope. I have a feeling it was after World War II. Yeah. Connected with this, and who could go where? Yeah, and you know who died? Somebody died. Uh -huh. No, he wasn't the world champion, uh -huh. and, and, and he was alive. He lived a long time. Al Alakine was mixed up with the Nazis. Yeah, now Alakine was the world champion, and he died, so there was no world champion. Okay. okay, that's never happened. It probably won't happen again either. And so they had a tournament to become world champion, whoever won the tournament. And they had five players, I think, unless they had six, and Bavinik was one of them, and he won. So he was the world champion. Now... When Bavinik won that tournament and became the world champion, he played many matches for world championship. Tall, Bronstein, Smyslav, Petrosian. The world champion never won a match. Never. When Bavinik was world champion, he either lost or drew the match. When the guy that beat him became world champion, they then lost the rematch to Bavinik. So if you were the reigning world champion, there was 0% that they won. 
A tough, tough game. You think the world champion win occasionally? No. The only world champion ever to win was Spassky. He won in 66 against Petrosian. So now Spassky is the world champion. Then he beat him in 69. And before that, nobody ever won the world championship. You're world champion, you lost. Rawr. Okay, so Bavnik was the world champion, so he lost to Petrosian. He didn't get a rematch because he's too old at that point. Okay, Petrosian played G3 now. Now that he can't play Rook C7, he's not so worried about this because his king can walk in. When the king was on E7, he couldn't do that. Bishop B4, the bishop was terrible on A5. King walks in. Oh, man, the king's walking in. And you guys thought I was kidding, but I wasn't. King's walking in. That's how you play the end game. What's wrong with a move like... Um, for whom? Uh, for black moving bishop e7. Right now? Instead of the rope move. Ah, bishop e7. Yeah, that's legal. Probably I would play... Well, I either play rook d2 or knight f6. I don't know. Uh, I'm leaning towards... Actually, I like both of them. What am I leaning towards? I guess knight f6. But this is my second choice. And the engine says, ah, the oh, wait, the, the computer doesn't know either. Come on, make my move jump over the first move. I don't think it's going to happen, <laughs> although it might. It says they both win. The computer's so confused. Now they're getting closer. Yeah. Yeah, the computer's making a lot of noise. The the fan that means White's winning. You hear that? You can hear it, right? Yeah. Yeah, that means White's winning. When the computer doesn't care, it doesn't make any noise. When it makes a lot of noise, that means somebody's winning. It's thinking a lot. Look at those numbers. Material's equal, and it's like 3.5. Isn't that crazy? I guess this move is better because you move your king, and I play king takes e6. I didn't see that. Computer sees Yeah, you're like, ooh, I like that. Yeah. But knight f6 is plus 3, so that's pretty good. Yeah. And I've been saying this over and over and over. Someday somebody will listen to me. Move your king up in the end game. Notice whose king has moved further up, not black. Okay, so rook h5 check, forcing the king even further up. Bishop e7 check, recommended by you. King g7. Now, if his king gets here, he can promote it, according to someone in St. Louis who asked me that once. Okay. They were like, now, when this piece gets to the back rank, that's a queen also. And I went, what? Okay. Yeah, they, did, they didn't mean the king, but they said other pieces. Okay. Truth hurts. Okay, so... Now, my knight is the best knight ever, my king is the best king ever, and my pawn structure is better, because this is an isolated pawn. So white's winning, strategically winning. e5, now his king can go to e6, and he'll checkmate white. No, not really. Rook c6, stopping everything. King f7, man, it's a tough position. Uh-oh, probably should save his bishop. You like that king? Yeah, now he has to move his bishop. Wow, tough position. So now, if you could play knight d5 or knight e6, that would be good, right? You agree, okay. And so I could play knight f6 to d5, knight c3 to d5, knight g5 to e6. Okay, got, got a lot of ways to do it. He played rook here. I guess that stops knight d5. But it doesn't stop knight e6. Man, that guy's lucky who's white. Rook d8 check. That stops knight e6. Rook d7 check. And black resigned. And I'm guessing plus 7. Let's see, plus 2. It's going to take me 25 minutes to get to plus 7. We don't have enough time for that. Yeah, it only says plus 2.5 now. Wow. Pretty bad position. It's funny how bad this bishop is. Because the pawns are on the same color as the bishop. And that means the bishop is trapped behind them. That's really bad. Okay, so a very nice game from Petrosian, who activated his rook, his knight, and his king, and took advantage. None of you would resign here because it's equal material. But world championship match. Probably, based on what you said before class... Probably this game was adjourned earlier and they came back and he resigned in a couple moves. Okay, one six he would have moved. Yeah, this is move forty eight. 
Usually between moves 40 and 45, they seal a move, then he's like, all right. And then he can analyze it with his... Getting crushed over here. Confusing the children. Like, what are you talking about? So for the children in the audience, which is most of you, I'm including you, um, <coughs> world championship matches and other grandmaster events, they didn't have sudden death. You guys know what sudden death is? It's every game you ever play. They didn't do that then. They played 40 moves in two and a half hours, then they played 16 moves in an hour, and they did it forever. 16 moves in an hour. So the game could go forever. It could go 15 hours if you played a long game. So after five hours, approximately, they would adjourn the game and play the next day. Right? So probably this game was adjourned, and they went, man, you're getting crushed over here. Then they came back, and he resigned in a couple moves. Because, you know, they analyzed it, man, you're getting crushed. So actually, a lot of the best end games were played 100 years ago and 50 years ago because they would adjourn the game and analyze it. Now you've got to play your own game. That's no good. And the level of play is terrible. Also, we have game in 90. Game, see, now you, you think game in 120 is slow. You're like, game in 30, that's fast. Game in 60, that, game in 120, now you're talking. Game in 120 would have been super fast back then. They played 40 moves in two and a half hours. Then they got another hour. Archer's like, what? What are you talking about, right? Is that what you want to do, play a seven-hour game? Rawr. Okay, so that's what they did. And therefore, a lot of games were decided between moves 40 and 50. They would adjourn the game. They go home. It's obvious what's going to happen after analysis, and they resign or agree to a draw. They don't come back and play a lot of moves because they've already analyzed it. Now, if you did that today, you would turn on five computers and go to sleep, and then you wake up and you play perfect. So we don't do that today. Even doing it back then was silly. But. Okay, and last but not least, we went back to 1907, and it was a world championship match. Are you shocked? Okay, and I was there. Okay, now this is the game Marshall versus Lasker. Okay, now, has anybody heard of Frank James Marshall? Anybody? I thought he was a Supreme Court justice. Yeah, that's close enough. That's, uh, that's another Marshall, right? What? Like the Marshall attack Marshall? Yeah, there's the, there's the Marshall Gambit in two different openings. In the French defense and the more common ones in the Rui Lopez. Yeah. Okay, so Emmanuel Lasker obviously was the second world champion. Second? Yeah, that's right. And he was world champion when this game was played. Okay, now this position is very difficult because both sides have advantages and disadvantages. Also, it's move 19 and all the pieces are on the back rank. Rawr. They didn't develop their pieces back then. Okay. And it says one. This is game one of the championship. Wow. Okay. So black has two advantages that I see, and white has one advantage. White's one advantage is these pawns are doubled. Black's advantages are the bishop against the knight and this isolated pawn. Also, it's black's move. I turned on the engine for a long time. It said black is slightly better. And after six moves, white could resign. Now, back in the early 1900s, players were not known for their end game technique. They were known for sacking all their pieces and mating you. So the person who was most known in America for playing wild and crazy and sacrificing was Marshall. Lasker was known as being a genius, strategical genius, world champion for 25 years. So Marshall's not going to play the end game as well as Lasker. Okay, Marshall, I'm sorry, Lasker played the only move you should think of in this position. What did Black play? Because why'd you do that? To open the rook. Yeah, the rook can get out. Yeah, bishop a6. Now, he played rook b8. And the reason is funny. Bishop a6 lets the rook out. Bishop h3 lets the rook out. Bishop g4 lets the rook out. But it's not sure where you should go yet. It's not clear. So he got his rook out another way with rook b8. With very subtle threats. White played the only move. Yep. And he played rook b5. So he got his rook out. And now Marshall made the losing move in my opinion. C4. And c4 is... Explosive. Okay. okay, and I don't like C4. It gives black a passed pawn. And probably, more importantly, 
uh, equally importantly, it loses a tempo. We got to get these guys going. All those guys are bad. C4 doesn't address any of that. And C4 gives Black a passed pawn. I don't like the move C4. Terrible. Now, you're glad your bishop's not on A6. If it was, you'd move it back somewhere else. Right? So Lasker's like, great, C4. Now, Black gained a tempo. He moved his rook, but gained a tempo, forcing White to do something. Yeah, and he could attack the e-pawn or the h-pawn, but if he attacks the e-pawn, I can defend it and develop. So he attacked the h-pawn. Because now white has to make another silly move. He played king g1, with a, with and now c5. Knight a3 have been better instead of c4 there? That's, I, mean, that's what... uh, I think anything's better than c4, yeah. Problem with knight a3 is you might lose your pawn on e4. Because if your knight goes to d2, you won't lose it. But here you, here you might lose it. I don't know. I guess I, I, I was thinking I could move your king away and play bishop f5, but I can't. So yeah. I yeah. So knight eight, yeah, any move is better than c4. Yeah, terrible. Yeah. And then c5, and we have a protected pass pawn, and this pawn's weak, and you still haven't got your pieces out yet. Okay, knight d2. Now we go back to the way I play. King f7, move your king up. Where's the king going? The answer is up. Yeah. Okay, now he stops all infiltration from the rook. Perfect. Doesn't block his bishop. He has a passed pawn, and this guy has an isolated pawn. a3, rook h6. And this is a brilliant move. a3 is probably a mistake. The idea was to play b4, and get rid of the defense of this pawn, knight b3, etc. But a3 weakens the a3 and b3 pawns. Notice this pawn chain, solid. Now after here, those pawns are weak, and black attack them with rook h6, rook here. And he can attack these pawns. Very nice. Solid. If you play a4, you can't ever move your pawns again. They're stuck. So he played rook a1. But now, as I said in the previous positions, I'm attacking, you're defending, advantage attacker. Now, the rook can't come in because it's doing something very passive. So bishop g4 activating the bishop, and he activates his king. Go king. Yes. And this position has equal material. I'm serious. Right? If I turn the engine on, it says like plus 3.5 for black. Because black's rook is better, black's king is better, black has a passed pawn that's protected, white's e-pawn is weak, and white's king can't move up. Black's bishop and pawn stop him. So there's no immediate win, but you're going to win eventually. And your idea of playing knight a3, probably you're going to c4 with your knight. Mm -hmm. That's good when the guy has double pawns, but now you have a pawn on c4. Nothing wrong with the double pawns now. In fact... Why would this be better than this? I don't know. This I don't like because white can put a knight or a rook in front of them and they can't move, but white can't do that because he played c4. <clears throat> so, let, so Marshall thought, I'll just block it up and it's a draw because he can't get in. But actually white can't do anything here. And if somehow white's king can't go to e3, which it can now, I could play d4, d3 and king d4 and I win. If black plays king d4, that should be a very easy win. So white has to stay over here. I don't think white can stay over there. I think it's very easy to kick him out. Then I play d4, d3, king d4, and I win. Yep. Bam. Just like I said. Yep, here comes the king. This is funny. He wants white to trade rooks because then white doesn't have a pass pawn anymore. The g pawn would stop it become an f-pawn. Yeah, now this pawn's not dangerous at all. And you can see the relative positions of the kings, which I occasionally talk about, right? Occasionally, every lesson, yeah. And you can see with the kings, it's ridiculous. Now, if this king was here and white's king was on d5, black would resign, black resigns. I play king takes c5, I take your d3 pawn, rawr. But the kings are like this, so white resigns. 
the truth hurts. King f2, stopping king e3, c6, and what do we call that? Six, yeah, you can't move. You could try to move. Good luck. C6, it's your move. It's unfortunate. I like where the knight is. I like where the king is, but I don't want to move them. If you got greedy and played king c3, I would play king e3. And then you'd probably put me in Zugzwang again. But yeah, now I don't know what I would do if I was white. Man, harsh. If I play a5, that's very temporary. He could play a6 or anything. That's what happened. Okay, that's what happened. I didn't know that. Knight b1, stopping king c3. King takes e4. Yum, yum, yum. Bishop e2. King e3. Knight b1. And they agreed to a draw. There's no way to break through. No, I'm kidding. Just kidding. f5. h5. King here. Uh-oh. Yeah, harsh. Man, tough position. King f4. Uh-oh. <laughs> you got to move the knight to one of the two places, but you don't want to. And this is funny. It reminds me of the last game where Petrosian beat Botvinnik. Petrosian's knight was on e4, and I was like, yay! Now the knight's on e4, but it's not stable, right? And you know, you know what, who likes stables? Horses. Yeah, did you get that? I didn't. Yeah. So when the knight was on e4 for Petrosian, it was there forever. It was great. Now, if I could keep my knight on e4 forever, I would still lose because after king e3, you would sacrifice one of the pawns and mate with the other one, right? I'll, I'll show you an example. I could play d2 and then f2 mate. If you don't like that, I could play f2 and then d2 mate, right? So even if the knight could stay on e4, two pass pawns is too many. Knight d6. That way if he plays king e3, we can check him away. c5. Zugzwang again. That was a very nice move. If the king moves, we queen this pawn. If the king moves here, we queen this pawn. And when I was going to play king e3, you were going to play knight f5 check. So if you move your knight, you can't play knight f5 check. Every move is zugzwang. That's why the guy was world champion. Play the end game well. b4, the only move. Otherwise, I'd play king e3 and mate you. Takes. Man, that's a lot of pass pawns. Yeah? Knight c4, stopping all the pawns. Okay, if you can't play king e3, what else do you want to play? It's very much like king e3. King f3? Or king e3, I mean. Yeah, king g3 seems good. What do you do about that? Man, if I was black, I'd play king g3. Yay, I'm the world champion 1907. And white resigned. Does the computer announce mate? Probably not. When I say probably not, I mean probably. Mate in 13, that's lucky. And then the computer starts making noise. Yeah, yeah this pawn's uh, coming in, yeah. So when that end game started, if we can go back to the beginning, which was a long end game, by the way, okay, and we turn the engine on, it says black is slightly better, right? It likes black. In fact, it plays your move, Bishop Basic. Yeah. And then in this position, do you see C4 as one of the three moves? No. Yeah, anything but C4. C4, then the yellow light goes on. See this light? Yellow's bad, red is really bad. And now black has a big advantage, and somehow Lasker plays the computer moves. Lucky, right? Yeah. And with the big advantage, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, then he was able to win the game. And... C4, giving black a passed pawn, terrible. And what's funny is, when black played D3, his king walked right in. Very nice. Yeah. If my student was white, and in this position, they decided not to move any of these pieces, I'd be like, what? Why are your pieces still on the back row? It's move 20. Well, I'll leave it there for another move. And after rook H5, still on the back row. King G1. Every move on the back row. And somehow he lost.
But, okay, Endgame wasn't the forte of a lot of players 150 years ago. So, usually, the players after 1940, they were playing the Endgame okay. But a lot of games didn't go to Endgames. In fact, this is very common today. If you go to a Scholastic tournament, Archer, a lot of the games are you taking all their pieces and you have four pieces in the Endgame. Now, it doesn't matter if you play the Endgame well. But if you go to a Grandmaster tournament, nobody's up four pieces in the end game. Okay. However, in Grandmaster tournaments 100 years ago, 150 years ago, there weren't so many end games because everybody's sacking their pieces and playing for a mate. So when you mate somebody, you win. When you don't mate them, you're down two pieces. Right? Then as players got more sophisticated, we had more equal end games. Then you had to move your king up, get past pawns, activate your pieces put your rook on the seventh rank. And people didn't know that 150 years ago, so they kept their pieces here. And then I was like, what? What are you doing? So we learned from these people, and then we play better. And Lasker was much stronger than Marshall. Marshall was a good American player, but when he played matches with Lasker, he didn't, he didn't even win any games. He'd lose like eight to zero, nine to zero, terrible. And some draws. Yeah. It's like if I play Carlson except for the draws, right? No, nothing. Uh, he thought it was funny. Yeah. Okay, and now, since it's eight, you can eat your food. Right? All right, thanks for coming to class. Uh, see you all next Tuesday for our great players of the past class. Your favorite class. No? Which players?